the gift horse. It is often said that every picture tells a story. Well, what about we write a story that paints a picture? So, picture, if you will, a brilliant blue sky with a blazing sun shining down on a city, modern, commercial, but in the centre, a maze of ancient alleyways which have survived centuries of change. On the coast, the quietly lapping shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea, a seaport, and, to save you further speculation, I'll tell you, it's Malaga, gateway to the costas of El Andalus, known mainly to holiday-makers as an airport, from which the sun-seekers and the fair-weather golfers are siphoned off their budget airlines and re-siphoned into air-conditioned coaches, rosaries hanging from the rear-view mirror, and driven by small, swarthy men, a strange-smelling cigarette glued to their lips. Smoking? Do I hear you say? Ah, yes, well, all right. This was in an age when most people did, and anyway, this isn't a modern picture. Nor is it an old master, although could be, sort of. All this, however, falls outside the scope of our canvas. Rather, we need to zoom in into one of those old shaded alleyways of which we spoke earlier, and there pick out a small café at which one of the pavement tables is occupied by two very different people, separated in every imaginable way. The man is very old, and the boy very young. The old man exudes confidence, arrogance even, and has no right to look as good as he does at his age, whilst the boy is obviously poor, out of his depth, and angry. Why is he angry? Well, it could be because the old man is laughing at him. Could it be because of something the boy has said or done? Perhaps the old man sees himself in the boy, but that is most unlikely. You see, this old man has never known hunger or deprivation, never been reduced to wearing rags, and certainly never had to beg in the streets. In fact, he had spent his entire life doing exactly what he wanted to do. He was born here, in Malaga, some eighty-five years before he appears in this painting. Strange to relate, his father was an artist, or rather he taught art at a local college. Then he and his family adopted the sort of peripatetic lifestyle not uncommon to one of his profession, teaching in all the large Spanish cities such as Barcelona, Madrid, and so forth. While doing so, his son, the old man in our picture, was learning about perspective and colour and line and all those techniques so fundamental to the practice of graphic art. Before long, this child was earning a reputation of something of a prodigy and was beginning to exhibit the maverick temperament and wayward genius that set him apart from his peers and alienated him from his teachers. This independent, not to say self-willed character, soon outgrew the artistic confines of his native Spain, and he took himself off to France, which, at that time, was at the forefront of artistic exploration, culminating in the great Impressionist movement of Northern Europe. Here, too, he experimented, sometimes dabbling in the established techniques of the great and the famous but he still pursued his own goals without necessarily knowing what they were. In Paris, he was recording on his canvases the stories of sitters, such as this one at his current coffee table. It seemed that his brush was only interested in the destitute and the dispossessed, but even that was only a phrase through which he was passing. If asked, however, he would never agree to having his work pigeonholed into this period or that period. And as he moved from Paris to Barcelona and back again to Paris, he took his work a step further, a step further from the established concepts set by critics and dealers, but he was beginning to be noticed. As his professional career gained momentum, so did his personal life. 
he collected and rejected mistresses, wives and children, all of whom became subject to and victims of his ego and his impossible temperament. The same temperament continued to drive him to further experiment and deeper self-expression. He inspired admiration in fellow artists and even guarded affection from other sources, but inevitably the praise was scornfully rejected and the love cruelly manipulated. He even alienated himself from his native Spain, although his motives for doing so were of a higher order than those exhibited to individuals. During both world wars, and particularly during the Spanish Civil War, his canvases were profoundly expressive of his hatred and loathing of organised violence, and it seemed as though this old, sunburnt man, with the penetrating eyes, had reserved his greatest inspiration for the portrayal of man's inhumanity to man. This was strange, because it was all so at odds with the callous, selfish and arrogant attitudes he showed in his dealings with individuals. Perhaps it was part of his genius, and without these two opposing sides to his nature, his work might not have enjoyed the same impact. Perhaps it was as necessary to bring these conflicting forces together as it was to mix the oils on his palate until exactly the right tone was achieved in order to illustrate the point he was making on his canvases. As wars, wives and mistresses came and went, blossomed and faded, so his fame grew until he was the most collectible of modern painters. He became rich, and like many rich men he guarded his money with care, becoming suspicious of the motives of those around him, some of whom no doubt flattered and were sycophantic in the hopes of enriching themselves at his expense. Certainly, if the dirty little gypsy boy in our picture was hoping for largesse from the great man's table, he was likely to be disappointed, and be in no doubt that is what he was about. Begging was his business, but at the age of six he still had much to learn. Streetwise he may be, but he had no idea who this old man was. Sitting at a street café table with his coffee, brandy and cigarettes, he was just another soft touch so far as the boy was concerned. Another chance for picking up a few pesetas, but we can see from the scowl on the boy's face that he was out of luck. The scowl contrasts markedly with the smile on the face of the old man, a mocking, challenging smile. Had the boy been on his home ground, he might have had the courage to avenge himself on that smile, perhaps tip the coffee into the old man's lap, or brush the brandy glass from the table. But the boy was far from home. His parents had travelled from Cordoba for the August Feria, that noisy, colourful week of carnival, fireworks, flamenco and bullfights. Good pickings for the gypsies, who often followed the celebrations from city to city, begging, picking pockets, fighting, and settling old stores with rival families from way back. But this was the first time the boy had come to Malaga with his father, or had indeed ventured anywhere outside his home in Cordoba, because there he knew every twist and turn of his home city, the Houdaria with its maze of narrow lanes flanked by secret courtyards in which tantalising glimpses of exotic blooms and greenery could just be sighted. He knew all the dark alleyways through which his skinny body would dart, clutching a camera, a watch or a purse, followed by complaining shouts in languages he couldn't understand. He had scarcely learned to walk before he'd mapped a complicated series of escape routes and safe havens in the warren of the old town. Even when a dirty bundle in his mother's arms, he practised a half-starved, pitiful look as she begged from fastidious American tourists outside the ancient walls of the Alcazar or the beautiful Moorish gateway to the Mesquita. His sisters, black-haired and ramrod straight-backed, walked him along the banks of the river Guadalquivir, swinging their hips and eyes at brooding ewes, lounging with damp cigarettes. As soon as he could stand, 
He was taught to stamp his tiny feet to the explosive rhythms of flamenco, and he clapped his pudgy hands as older children whirled and pounded to a background of guitar and wailing arias of love and longing. Oh, no, he was at home in Cordoba, and felt secure there, but here, here in the more cosmopolitan atmosphere of a coastal town, he was not so sure of himself. The Guardia, impassive and bleak, watched him. If he had to, he wouldn't know where to run, which turn to take. The old quarter of Malaga, like Cordoba, was an intricate system of alleyways, but they were different and offered none of the sanctuary of his own city. Here he felt exposed and vulnerable. And that was why the old man was getting off with a scowl. Why, though, should these two protagonists of this particular scene, these two opposites, one very old, the other very young, one self-assured, rich both in talent and in wealth, the other predestined at his young age to follow a life of petty crime and uncertainty, why exactly are they reacting in the way that they are portrayed? The answer to this particular question lies in a crumpled piece of paper lying on the table by the old man's ashtray. True, you have to look very carefully to see it, because this little drama is only part of a wider picture, but there it lies, nothing more than a crumpled paper napkin, and it is this abandoned scrap of rubbish which is the cause of the old man's cynical smile and the urchin's glower. How this came about is simple, and possibly you've already guessed it, especially the identity of the famous old man who is visiting the city of his birth after a long absence. He managed to slip away from his entourage of family and hangers-on, made for the old quarter of the town, where he could find a quiet table in the shade of a tree and, for once in a long time, enjoy a moment of anonymity together with a coffee and a cognac. The young gypsy, on his part, had wandered from the uncertain protection of his father, now argumentatively drinking in a bar far less reputable than the one in our picture. He had decided to explore and see what this strange town had to offer in the way of profit. What he found was, in fact, this old man, enjoying his freedom, simply dressed but smoking an expensive foreign cigarette and looking equally expensively bronzed. The boy immediately started to beg in his well-rehearsed manner, which usually earned him enough pesetas for a tortilla or a coke. Please, senor, my mother is dead. I am an orphan. I have not eaten for three days. The old man regarded the boy with tolerant good humour before replying in gutter Spanish, which surprised the boy, who had assumed he was dealing with some witless foreigner. You are a liar, most probably a thief, so bugger off, leave me in peace. The boy, somewhat taken aback by this, tried again, and kept on, until the old man said, Look, I never give money to anybody. Unless I think they've earned it, I'm always told I'm tight-fisted, and I have no intention of ruining a well-deserved reputation by giving money to a scruffy little nobody like you. But after a competitive sip of his brandy, he added, I have some reputation as an artist. And draw your picture. You can have that instead. The boy started to whine and moan that a picture wouldn't satisfy his hunger, but once he saw that the old man wasn't going to part with anything else, he nodded his agreement. The old man didn't ask him to pose or even sit down, but allowed the boy to look on as he rapidly drew a few lines on the napkin the waiter brought with the coffee. Within seconds he'd finished and passed it over to the boy, who, taking one look, shrieked. It was nothing like him. In fact, not like anything at all. Just a few worthless lines on a useless napkin. Who did the old man think he was a fool, taking advantage of a helpless child? He screwed up the napkin, 
and threw it back on the table, which is exactly where we came in. Pablo Picasso smiled, and the boy scowled back. Now, if you have been concentrating very hard on this picture, you might just have seen a figure standing in the shadowed doorway of the cafe. That's the one. The one with the black apron. What you won't be able to see, because by now the picture is framed and hanging on some wall or other, but Picasso drained his glass, and, still smiling, walked off into the labyrinth. The waiter, who was only too well aware of the illustrious presence at the cafe, and had witnessed the scene just illustrated, prayed that the napkin wouldn't blow away. He now went out and picked it up. He smoothed it out almost reverently and carefully, placed it between the pages of a book. After Pablo Picasso's death in 1973, this waiter made all the right inquiries, and he sold the napkin. Not worth a fortune, but enough for him to buy the cafe. Oh, yes, <laughs> and a small but profitable bar down by the port. <laughs>